In the last video we looked at the transistor terminal characteristics and we concerned ourselves with the base current versus VBE and the collector current versus VZE. Before we go into more technical detail let's have a look at what we call transistor action. How does it actually work? Um, we're not necessarily interested in um, being able to say well this is an amplifier or whatever we just like to get our heads around um, how does the terminal characteristic for the transistor control currents and voltages in the circuit so here's a little circuit and um, although I said we're not going to be in, you know necessarily interested in amplifiers this is an amplifier and let's just uh, have a look at what we've got here we've got uh, some a DC voltage source in series with a little AC voltage source connected via RB to our transistor. We've got our collector resistor connected to VCC. We don't necessarily know what all of these things are for yet, um, but I can tell you that VBB is required so that the transistor stays on. Now remember, in order for the transistor to be on, we need the base emitter voltage to be around about 0.7 of a volt. The idea is that this voltage source here is what we call a small signal voltage source. It might only go between, say, plus or minus 100 millivolts. If we didn't have VBB here, that plus or minus 100 millivolts simply wouldn't be enough to turn on the base emitter junction. Right, we need 0.7 of a volt there, um, and uh, the transistor would in fact stay off. So we need this voltage source here, upon which this um, AC signal rides, um, and it's VBB which keeps the device turned on. All right, so we're interested in seeing what happens around this, what we call the input loop. And we're also interested in what happens around what we call the, the output loop. So we're going to investigate this input loop using the input terminal characteristic. And we're going to investigate what happens at the output here with the output characteristic. So let's start with the input. Here's the input loop this base voltage we're calling, or VBB, the um, small signal voltage, resistor, and just the base emitter junction. We've just ignored the rest of the circuit for now. I've even applied some, given some values here, I'm suggesting VBB is 2 volts, RB is 250K, and initially we're going to assume that VIN is equal to zero. Now I can write down Kirchhoff's voltage law for this uh, input loop, right? I can say that VBB plus VN equals IBRB plus VBE. Now from this I can write an expression for IB. I can isolate IB. IB equals VBB plus VN over RB minus VBE over RB. Now VN is equal to zero, so that doesn't uh, appear. So we end up with VBB over RB minus VBE over RB. So here's our straight line equation involving the base current, which is on the vertical axis, and VBE, which is the horizontal axis. When we plug in the values VBV over RB and so on, we discover that the intercepts are 8 microamps and 2 volts. So this is the load line for the input loop when VN is equal to 0. In addition, we've got the input terminal characteristic of the transistor overlaid there. And clearly the operating point for the input loop when V in is zero is here. So when V in is zero, this is the base current, this is the base emitter voltage. But we're really interested in understanding what happens 
as v in moves away from zero. Well, let's see what happens. So our equation is the same. Let's imagine that v in can now go between plus or minus half a volt. That means that our load line can now go move up and down, right? And it can go up by half a volt because of v in, and it can go down by half a volt when v in is minus 500 millivolts. That means that our operating point, which started out there when v in is zero, can move up to this point here and down to that point there. So as V in is going up and down, that causes IB to go up and down simply because the operating point moves up and down the device curve here. And you can see that VBE doesn't change very much at all because the slope of this curve is so great. And even though VBE is only changing by a few millivolts, um, IB is changing significantly on this um, vertical scale here. Okay, so a changing V in here causes a changing IB. And of course that gets reflected in the output terminal characteristic. So let's have a look now at the output loop. Here's the output loop and I've suppressed the input loop because we're not interested in that. I can write an equation for the load line for the output loop, right, because I know that VCC is equal to ICRC plus VCE. And I can solve for IC, it's VCC over RC minus VCE over RC. When I plug in the values, I discover that my intercepts are 4 milliamps and what looks like 3.5 volts. So here's the load line for the output loop. And superimposed on that is the family of curves for the transistor for a given value of IB. So when IB was, sorry, when VN was equal to zero, we had a particular value of IB. Let's say it's that one there. That means that the transistor operating point, namely the collector current and the collector emitter voltage was sitting there. Now as VN increased, that caused IB to increase, which means we are switching to a different line, which means our operating point is moving up. So maybe if the base current moved from that value to this value, our operating point would move up this curve until it reached there. And then maybe when we hit minus 500 millivolts for VN, the base current ends up coming down to here, then we would move from that part of the curve down to this part of the curve. And so you can see that as the V in goes up and down, IB goes up and down, and therefore um, our operating point, right? The specific pair IC and VCE moves up and down this curve. So that's how the device works and you can see that as IB increases IC increases because we're moving up here but as IC increases do you see that VCE decreases right? because this slope has this curve load line has a negative slope and as IC decreases VCE increases so that's something to bear in mind and that will become significant later on. All right, so we call this the transistor action. This allows us to see how the voltage and currents in the circuit behave based on the, um, the input and the output terminal characteristics. Now, later on, we're going to stop referring to these um, load lines, but they're important at the moment because they help us understand what's going on.
Later on we'll deal exclusively with mathematical models for the transistor and we'll just have equations but we can always come back to these diagrams to understand what's really happening. So they're very important. Okay, the next thing we want to look at with transistors is what's called the regions of operation. So here's the output curve with the funky printing artifact. And um, if we had to write down an equation to describe all of this, it would be kind of messy and not super useful because Clearly we're going to have some sort of nonlinear equation. We know from our work with diodes that nonlinear equations can be the death knell for pen and paper work. So can we isolate certain regions of this characteristic um, which would allow us to write down some simpler equations that we could actually figure out just with uh, a piece of paper and a pen? Well, if we stare at this thing long enough, it turns out that there are three main regions. The first region is called the cutoff region. And the cutoff region occurs, and let me just grab another, another diagram here. The cutoff region occurs when VBE is less than half a volt. Okay, so here's VBE around about half a volt there. Clearly, when VBE is less than half a volt, there's no base current. And if there's no base current, there can be no collector current. So if IB is zero, then IC is zero. And the cutoff region corresponds to this region down here, right down here around IC equals zero. That's the cutoff region comes about because VBE has dropped to below half a volt, which means that IB is zero, which means that IC is zero, and we say the device is off or it's in cutoff. Another region um, is this sort of region here where the curves start to bend around. And if we're a little bit generous, maybe we'll maybe even extend it out to there. This is called the saturation region. And initially the saturation region can seem kind of difficult to understand, but it's not really. Remember from our output characteristic that when we're discussing transistor action, as the base current increases, our operating point is moving up this curve here. How far can it go? Well, it can't go any further than this intersection point here. We may want it to go further, but it cannot. It's stuck there. And what's the, you see, there are no further intersection points north of this point here. So the collector emitter voltage is not zero. It's some small value and the collector current is set at some uh, constant maximum value. This is called saturation. We cannot move any further than that point there. And so that's what helps us define the saturation region. Now the saturation region is technically a little bit different depending on what our load line uh, intersection points are, but to keep life easy for us, we're just going to assume that the saturation voltage, namely VCE, when we collide with the uh, topmost curve, is equal to 0.2 of a volt. At saturation, VBE is 0.7 of a volt, because clearly the transistor is conducting, because saturation corresponds to a large base current and a large collector current and we can only have those if the dia if the transistor is conducting and therefore VBE is 0.7 of a volt. And the final region is what we call the active region and the active region corresponds to these nice horizontal lines 
clearly we have current flowing IC is, uh, is non-zero so we must have VBE equal to 0.7 of a volt. In this region here remember that the collector current is independent of the collect emitter voltage. The only way that we can move from curve to curve is by changing the base current not the collector emitter voltage and it turns out that when we are in this regime of these um, uh, constant current lines that the collector current is equal to some factor which we call beta times the base current. It also turns out, although well, it may not be obvious, that VBC has to be negative in the active region. So we've identified three possible regions that we can um, handle separately. One is the saturation region, one is the cutoff region where the device is not on, and finally the active region where we have these lines of constant current. So we can summarize that behavior in a table. When the transistor is in cutoff, VBE is less than half a volt. The collector current, the base current are both zero. When we are in saturation, the transistor is conducting, so VBE is 0.7 of a volt, but the collector emitter voltage cannot drop below some small but non-zero voltage, which for us this year is going to be 0.2 of a volt. And it turns out that VBC is about 0.5. And if you have a look at it, that's just 0.7 minus 0.2. And finally, in the active region, the collector current is some fixed factor times IB. The device is conducting, so VBE is 0.7 and the base collector voltage has to be negative. And finally, it turns out that if we want to use it as an amplifier, we must be in the active region. We must be in the active region all the time. We can't nip out, get saturated, then come back in. That will simply distort um, whatever it is we're trying to amplify. But when we want to use the transistor as a switch, we basically want to be in the cutoff region or the saturation region. We don't want to spend any time in the active region. Now it turns out that going from cutoff to saturation means you, the transistor has to pass through the active region, but we want to get through that active region as quickly as possible. Now wouldn't it be nice if we had models for these three regions of interest? And that's what we'll look at next.